Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church with us here at Niagara United Mennonite. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, by being here with us today, you've become my Valentine this morning. That's very kind of you to be here and to be my Valentine today. Appreciate that. <laughs> but in all seriousness, let me tell you firsthand uh, that God definitely wants you to be his Valentine today, and he says that he loves you. But we're going to get more into that a little bit later today. Let me give you some announcements before we begin our time of worship together this morning. First off, that this Tuesday is Shrove Tuesday or Pancake Tuesday, as it's known in some Christian traditions. And we're going to be celebrating by doing Shrove Tuesday at home. Uh, we're going to be doing a Zoom call from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. That's this Tuesday night. And we're going to have a chance to chat, get caught up with one another, perhaps see some people that you haven't seen for some time uh, during this uh, COVID crisis. Pancakes are optional. If you'd like to eat pancakes, you're welcome to, but you don't have to necessarily. If you'd like to participate, you can register by going to our website at redbrickchurch.ca and signing up there. You'll need a Realm account in order to do that. Or you can contact Emily Fegeth, our office administrator at the church. Give her a phone call at the church and let her know you'd like to participate as well. And we'll get you the Zoom link and any information that you need. Uh, if you participated in our virtual choir over Christmas, we have another opportunity to do that in the near future with more virtual choir songs. Or if you'd like to participate for the first time, you're welcome to. All you have to do is contact uh, Rachel Peters, our worship coordinator at rachel at redbrickchurch.ca, and she will get you the information that you need in order to participate. I've been told to tell you that uh, if you enjoyed being in the Christmas uh, virtual choir, the songs they're going to do from here on out are going to be even easier to learn and even more fun to sing. Hey, if you're between the ages of 18 to 35, we'd like to invite you to Coffee and Concepts, which is going to be Sunday, February 28th, last Sunday of the month, from 7.30 to 9 o'clock p.m. And this is a chance for us just to have some spiritual conversations together. We're going to connect over a Zoom call, uh, discuss uh, scripture, ideas about faith, and life and just have a chance to have some good spiritual conversations together on a Sunday night. Coffee again is optional. You can bring whatever beverage you'd like to enjoy during that time. If you'd like to participate and get the Zoom link for that, uh, you just have to contact me, chris at redbrickchurch.ca, and I'll get you the information that you need. Is that enough information that I've gone over this morning? Let me lead us in a call to worship and then a prayer, and then we'll move into the rest of our time together this morning. Well, we're called to bring a new understanding of God, that God so loves the world. We're the salt of the earth. We're called to bring a new hope in God, that God gives us new life. We are the light of the world. We are called to follow the commandments and the law. And the law of God is to love God and to love one another. Come, let us be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Come, let us love one another with the love of God. Let us join together in our love of God to worship and follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Well, Heavenly Father, we pray for the Christian community. May the words of Jesus and his healing touch help us to live unselfishly and focus on serving others in the wider community. We pray for all social outcasts. May the words of Jesus and his healing touch inspire us to regard everyone as a possible neighbor. We pray for those suffering in mind and spirit. May the words of Jesus and his healing touch help us to care for them with dedication and good humor. For those excluded from society, the poor, the refugees, the handicapped, May the words of Jesus and his healing touch help us to love them and come to their aid, just as Jesus did. Let us pray in the silence of our hearts for our own personal intentions. God who saves, your son can restore the outcast. Have mercy on us. Stretch out your hand over us and touch us, and we will be saved. Amen. Good morning, everyone. 
everyone. Um, I'm here today talking with Austin Patterson, and she works at Shaver, and I thought um, I would touch base with her. Um, she's had a, a bit of an interesting situation at Shaver in the last few months, so I thought it would be interesting to touch base with someone who's working on the front lines um, and just, yeah, see how things are going. So, hi, Austin. Hi, Rach. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'll ask you a few questions and then you can just answer however you want. Um, so how long, when did things start changing at Shaver? What's the scoop? What's going on? Specifically for this um, COVID outbreak at Shaver, it started right around Christmas time. So this outbreak meant that now visitor visitors wouldn't be allowed to come until the outbreak got under control. The whole vibe at work was very um, different and kind of like how the priority shifted um, to how can we keep everyone safe. Yeah, so what does that look like then, um, like for the for the patients that are at Shaver, what, what would their lives look like today versus like before the outbreak? So before COVID, it was very, um, patients' days would be very busy. They would have um, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, social works, speech therapy, they would have a whole schedule that they would get. And now, especially with the outbreak, they have been limited to basically like, what can you do at your bedside? Even transferring between patients, you have to change all of your PPE. So even the simplest of tasks, like delivering meal trays has become completely cumbersome. And so now therapy staff have um, needed to step in to do small rules like that, that were originally just like taken for granted, oh, nurses or whoever would go in, drop the trays. and Well, that kind of leads into my next question because I wanted to ask, um, aside from the patients, how has your role changed now um, in the last month or month and a half? My role is I'm a communication disorders assistant in the speech department. So I before was just doing back-to-back one-on-one therapy with patients. We've been able to do like the, the people who need speech therapy, we've been able to do telephone calls. So our offices are down in the outpatient, but then they have extensions. So we get to call their extension and say like, oh, good morning or whatever, or this is Austin from speech. Did you want to do a session? And then we can talk to them for half an hour on the, on the phone and go through some of the goals that the speech pathologist has outlined for them over the phone, like oral motor exercises and all these different things. But there's also limitations with like patients are really tired or if their hearing isn't good. Um, so then if we can, we've been trying to get up to the, to the unit to do a little bit. I've had this really cool opportunity of being able to work for the past three weekends as like just helping out nursing. So um, in a sense, there's a lot that I can't do because I haven't, like I'm not a nurse, but I've been able to help deliver trays and I've just been able to uh, be there on the weekends to visit because patients are also getting like just very, very lonely and sad. Mm -hmm. It's been really nice to have the chance to be able to to talk with patients there and to just kind of see how they're doing and mm -hmm. um, and I'm just very hopeful for so on Friday yesterday the outbreak was declared over, which means that on Monday I think we're getting some new admissions, but I don't know exactly like the order or whatever that will look like, but I think things are moving in a better direction than they have been for the past month where like it just seemed to spread like crazy, even though everyone was doing their best to contain it. Right, right. Well, that was, that also kind of leads into what I was going to ask um, about like moving forward. So you said that like, um, if the outbreak is over, that doesn't mean that things go back to normal, obviously, but it does mean things like new patients can come in. Any ideas of what, what it might look like for the next month? Um, yeah, any insights into that? Yeah, so that, I think they've been talking about what it will look like to reintroduce, like, potentially visitors. But yeah, just to kind of hope that things go in the direction of, like, more therapy, more freedom, more visitors would be, like, the ultimate hope as long as new cases don't come up. Thank you. 
Hi, girls. Hello. Can you wave to everybody on, on TV? What is today? Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. And what does Valentine's Day talk about? Hearts. Making heart for somebody. Yeah, but what love. are the hearts? It's love. And who gives us love? God. I can see Rebecca's got a heart on her, and Rachel has pink, and I can see that, I know Rachel's socks are pink, pink too. Okay, today we're going to talk about what happens when God puts love into our hearts, and what we're supposed to do with it. So what we can do is we'll put a little bit of this into here. Now, Rebecca, can you put this into here? Can you do that? Can you pour all that in? That's it. Okay. Now that's all the people. That's all the people. People who are... Are people sometimes hard to love? Yes. Yes. But who do you love? Who do you love? Uh, family, cousins, friends, friends, Aunt Aiden, omas, opas, grandmas, grandpas. Grandpas. And sometimes there's people who... Do. So this... This is everybody, and this is you. Rachel, can you put God's love into you? Can you put that in? God puts his love into us. Okay, thank you. All right, now what we can do is, Rebecca, can you, let's just mix this around a little bit, and there, look at, we have... God's love in us, and we want to put it in everybody else. So we have to show other people love. So Rachel can, or Rebecca, can you pour your love into other people? Can you show the kids what happens when you pour your love into other people? Pour it real fast, real fast. Look at your love just comes and it grows and it grows and it keeps growing. And it, and growing and, growing. and it just keeps growing. You can touch it after everybody. Wait, wait, we're going to say goodbye first. This goodbye. is what happens. Can you tell the kids, Happy Valentine's Day? Happy Valentine's Day! And goodbye. say goodbye. Bye. See ya. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 22, verse 34 to 40. There is an ancient legend that speaks of God's struggle to guide the destiny of humanity. It is said that God had grown tired of the way that mortals constantly lose their way, creating disasters as they go. So he sent out his angelic messengers to gather together the timeless wisdom contained in the world and to place this wisdom into a multitude of books that would be housed in a great library, a library that mortals could use in order to work out how they should live and act in the world. When, after many millennia, the great task was completed, the colossal library stood proudly in one of the world's great cultural capitals, dominating the skyline. However, this huge building contained too many books for any individual to read. It was all but impossible to reach for the majority of people, and the library's sheer size was enough to put anyone off even entering it. So God demanded that his couriers compress the essential wisdom into a single encyclopedic book. Once completed, this single work was widely circulated, but the manuscript was so huge that one could hardly lift it, let alone read it or put what it said into practice. So yet again, God put his couriers to work, crafting a booklet with all the essential information. But the people were lazy and there were many who couldn't read so the booklet was refined into a single word, and that word was sent out on the lips and life of a messenger. And the word, it was love. 
Well, it seems appropriate to tell a love story on Valentine's Day, and this particular story is shared by the author and theologian Peter Rollins in his book, The Orthodox Heretic. And that story itself is called The Book of Love. We are all looking for wisdom. We are all looking for meaning. Who are we in relation to our family history? Who are we in relation to our workplace and our social circles? Who are we in relation to the world? Who are we in relation to the universe? We all have our systems and stories of being, and it's from these systems and stories that we create laws, creeds, or ideas about what we should and shouldn't do. And this is why we have so many debates isn't it, about what we should or shouldn't do. In fact, if you're watching this service right now in our online church service, uh, maybe you can type a few words in the chat. Go ahead and type a few words about what are some of the things that you debate with people about or that you have witnessed debates with people about. Well, in the scripture passage that we heard this morning, Jesus participates in a debate. Uh, some rabbis or teachers, rabbi is the Hebrew word for teacher, uh, approach Jesus and they engage him in small talk, in kind of the way that uh, rabbis generally do small talk. Uh, in rabbi circles in the first century, uh, you didn't engage in small talk by asking about the weather or asking if someone is working or hardly working, uh, what you do is you ask the question, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And in fact, you can turn with me to that passage right now if you like. If you have a Bible on you this morning, uh, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Uh, Matthew is usually the first book in the New Testament, more than halfway through the Bible. Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. And the rabbis ask, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And it's interesting, Jesus does some spiritual Aikido here. He does a little bit of spiritual redirection. He doesn't come at them with a law or with something new and aggressive to say. Instead, he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus doesn't give them a right type of clothing to wear, what shows they should watch, what sort of political system they should employ. He says, love, and you'll fulfill any other laws. He doesn't write anything new. He takes a teaching from the Old Testament that rabbis already would have been familiar with, but he gives them a new understanding of how to read it. If you're wondering what to do, then love. And Jesus will go on in the gospel stories to then exemplify what love looks like. Years ago, when I was in university, I was part of a group of people reading through the gospel of John. And at one point, a few of us uh, took a moment to stop and say, has anyone noticed that Jesus hasn't laid down any laws yet, but he has shown example after example of love? Uh, the Apostle Paul very poetically summarizes what Jesus teaches us about love in that wonderful piece of scripture that we hear every summer and when we go to weddings, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Again, if you have a Bible with you, you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you're watching at our online church service, you can also click on the Bible tab, and that'll bring up some scripture for you uh, to check it out for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at, let me look it up here, verse 4. Chapter 13, starting at verse 4. Paul says that love is patient and kind. It isn't jealous or boastful, or proud, or rude. Love doesn't keep records of when it's been wronged. It's never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful, 
and it endures through every circumstance. Uh, in his commentary on his story, The Book of Love, uh, Peter Rollins says that it's love that will motivate us to create political solutions regarding environmental issues, social injustice, and ethical problems. But it's also love that should motivate us to question all existing political solutions, testing whether they really do deliver freedom and liberty. Peter Rollins reminds us that Jesus says that laws were made for people, not people for laws. Without love, political and ethical systems can become oppressive and unyielding. Without love, we can become dogmatic legalists, dogmatic legalists, following holy books, sacred rites, and religious creeds without regard for their true purpose. And that doesn't just apply to church. That applies to any political or ethical system that we create. God comes down in the person of Jesus to remind us of our place in a story. That when you were born, every part of you was intimately created by the, God, by the, by the love of God, by that first love that is God. God made you. He saw everything about you, and he said, I love you. But as we come into the world, we desperately search for ways to love. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that with our very first breath when we're born, we cry out for safety and for love. And the things of the world come along to us, and they tell us, if you're smart enough, then you will be loved. If you're strong enough, then you will be loved. If you're rich enough, then you will be loved. If you're important enough, if you are righteous enough, then you will be loved. But these are lies. Lies that cover the truth that says from the very first atom, from the very first molecule, from the very first gene of your body, God looked at you and he said, you are loved. And every system of meaning we create, every system of belief that we create, desperately tries to get back to that idea that you are loved. All the wisdom that ever existed in the world can be summarized up in one word, and that is love. You were made by love, and it is love that calls you home. Now, if you're here with us today, or if you're listening today, and you're feeling and saying to yourself, well, it's been a long time since I felt love. Or you're here today and you're saying or feeling that I've been hurt by love. Please hear me when I say that I'm so sorry, but I'm glad that you're here. And I know that your pain is all too real and it's all too deep. Please hear me when I say, if you're feeling this way today, I know. And I understand. But maybe you're here today and you do need to hear this message this morning that on this Valentine's Day, God says that you are loved. You are infinitely loved by the first love that made you, that knows you through and through, that knows all the good parts and all the bad parts of your life. And no matter what, he loves you. Maybe this Sunday you need to pray in order to reconnect with love. Maybe this Sunday you need to experience love in community. Uh, and if you like, you can do that by signing up for home church. Uh, home churches are small groups of intergenerational uh, people that we have in our church who meet to do life together uh, throughout the week in community. If you'd like to know about that, you can uh, contact me and I'd be happy to connect you with that. Jesus says in John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We're supposed to be the ones that when people look at us, they say, wow, if there is one thing that defines the church, it is love. How might we as the church align ourselves much more closely to love this Valentine's Day? the love that is the wisdom of the world. 
you know, recently I had a disagreement with a, a family member, a very serious disagreement. And it was, it was very obvious that I had, I had hurt this person. And initially when they expressed uh, their hurt to me, um, I got defensive. I wanted to feel that it was my own actual victimization that led to things being wrong. But I found myself thinking at the same time, is my need to be right in line with love? I couldn't honestly say yes to that. And so I, I struggled with what to say. I, I just tried to rack my brain. And, and the best thing I could come up with at that time was, what is the most loving thing that I can do for you? I don't know if that was the right thing to say or the right thing to do, but it was my best attempt at trying to be in line with love in my interaction with this person, in line with the love that created me and that created this person who is loved by God just as much as I am. Now, let me close by telling you one final story, and then I'll pray for us, and we'll wrap up our time today. Uh, I was reading uh, a book by Andrew Root called The End of Youth Ministry. As one does when you're employed as a youth pastor, you read a book called The End of Youth Ministry. Makes sense. Uh, but there's a great story that Andrew tells in this book. He describes reconnecting with a young lady who had once been in his senior youth group. She graduated and gone to university. And he reconnects with her for coffee one day. When he meets up with her, she tell, he asks how she's doing. And she says that she's doing great. Uh, but she really feels like she's left behind faith. She feels that in the things that she's learned in university, particularly things that are related to science, that she has now grown up and moved on from the silly little things that she used to believe when she went to church. She felt that science could answer all of the questions that she'd initially looked to faith for. And Andrew was obviously devastated by this. Uh, there were a couple of questions that he asked. Uh, one was, what made this person come to feel that science is more mature and adult than faith? What made this person believe that science and faith have to be separate? But most of all, Andrew felt like a failure as a youth pastor. Well, several months later, uh, Andrew was at the Christmas Eve service for his church, and this woman shows up at the service. Andrew is obviously very shocked to see this, considering the conversation that they'd had, and he says as much when he comes up to see her and says, I'm surprised to see you here after the conversation that we had. And her response was that her sister had died, and she was devastated, and she felt so alone. She didn't know what she was looking for, but she thought perhaps coming to church might be might be a solution. Uh, it was that 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 it was at that moment that Andrew's young daughter came up at that point, and Andrew introduced his daughter to the young lady, saying, "This is my friend. Her sister died recently." And Andrew's young daughter climbed down out of his arms, walked over to the young woman, and hugged her, and she said, "I'm sorry." that your sister died. And the young woman broke down. And she all of a sudden realized this was what she had been looking for. This is what she had come to church looking for, and it was love. You were made by love, and love calls you home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we bring our hearts and our souls and our minds to you this morning. Lord, please hold us in the entirety of all our experiences today. Lord, when we have experienced great moments in life that we celebrate, please hold us. When we have experienced low points in our life, points of pain and loss and hurt, Lord, please hold us. Lord, we give you thanks that you didn't appear to us as a vague, abstract deity or something that seemed otherworldly or distant from us, but that you appeared to us in the person of Jesus, that you appeared as a person who holds hands, 
who can be hugged, who we could place our ear against their chest and hear a heartbeat. Thank you that you communicated to us that this is how intimate of connection you want with us, that you want to express love in a way that we feel and experience every day in our human interactions. Thank you for that gift. And Lord, I pray for those of us who may have been hurt by love. I pray that today we would get a glimpse of healing, perhaps see something, some sort of light breaking through the darkness. I pray for restoration. I pray for health. Most of all, Lord, I pray that we as a church would be a place where people come to for healing, where they come to for love. And in turn, we become a community that goes out with that love and is known for it throughout the larger Niagara community. Lord, help us to be creative, inspired, and excited with ideas, inspired by your love. May that love fuel everything we do, give us everything we need. May it be the wisdom of the world that we need. Help us to remember how simple it is. Lord, help us to remember how great it can also be. Lord, we want to come home to your love. And I pray that you would welcome us all there. And I pray these things in your son's name. Amen.